Hello everyone, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an easy and smart way of covering the newspaper for the civil service examination. We are going to discuss today's newspaper, The Hindu, dated 9th April 2020. The articles we will be taking up for discussion has been shown in the table and the time stamping for the same has been given in the description section of the video. This news is from page number 7. It is titled, Financing the Pandemic Rescue Package. This is an important article. A. It deals with the most important issue of the present time, the issue of financing the fight against pandemic of coronavirus. And B. It is very pertinent to certain section of our syllabus. For instance, in GS Paper 3 under the economy, there's a topic mentioned, mobilization of resources. And this article is very pertinent to this topic of the syllabus. Recently, Union Finance Minister has announced Rs 1.7 lakh crore relief package for coronavirus epidemic under Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana. Out of this 1.7 lakh crore rupee, 60,000 crore is being cited from State Disaster Response Fund. We did a State Disaster Response Fund in detail in the DNS dated 29th March 2020. There we saw that this fund is established under Disaster Management Act 2005. It is kept under public accounts of the central government. It is given as grant in aid to the state government. And 75% of this fund comes from the central government for general category states and 90% for special category states. Now 60,000 crore is already there in the fund and time has come that this fund will be utilized. But the question has to be asked from where the rest of 1.1 lakh crore is going to come. This question is very pertinent one looking at not so healthy macroeconomic parameters of India. For instance, the combined fiscal deficit of central and state government stands at 7.5% and the combined debt of the central and the state government is 69% of India's GDP. So these are not so healthy macroeconomic parameters indicators. And there are legitimate concern that borrowing money of such high tune may actually aggravate the macroeconomic stability of Indian economy. So in this context, the article becomes very important as to what can be done. What can be done to finance the fight against coronavirus without affecting the macroeconomic stability of India. The article provides three solutions. One of them is innovative, the other two repetitive. The innovative one is to issue GDP link bonds. Although it has been done before by other countries, but it has not been tried in India. And the other two repetitive solution is to monetize the non-core assets of PSUs and to tap into the excessive liquidity of PSUs. This actually is the focus of the article, issuance of GDP linked bonds. GDP linked bonds are actually bonds with floating rates issued by countries to borrow money from the market and that floating rate actually is linked with the GDP growth of the country. So if there is high GDP growth, there is high return on the bond. If there is low GDP growth, there would be low return. GDP links bond becomes important in the present scenario because it is advantageous to the sovereign borrower. Reason being that there is lower possibility of default. Obviously, because the interest payment has to be less when the GDP growth is less. So even if the economy is slowing down, the burden on the borrower, the sovereign borrower, the government will not be mounting up. And because of the same reason, there will be high sustainability of the debt for the sovereign borrower. And because of this, there will be reduced risk of contagion. Contagion effect meaning when the government starts to default, the whole economy starts to get throttled up. And the investor flies away, the money from FII goes away, FDI stops coming in and the economy starts to get choked up. So that kind of contagion effect will not be there. And you must also understand that volatility for these bonds will be less compared to the volatility of equity and debt market. Equity and debt market are dependent upon even one single incidence. But GDP growth rate doesn't change because of one or few here and there incidents in the economy. Because the scale at which we are talking about the GDP growth rate is a wide and huge scale. And the scale in which the debt market or the equity market works is a narrower scale than GDP. So the changes in the GDP growth rate is much less than the changes expected for equity and debt market. So these are more volatile and GDP linked bond market will be less volatile. However, 
The government may deliberately slow the GDP growth rate in order to reduce the interest rates on GDP linked bonds if the borrowing through GDP linked bond is very high. And since it's a new instrument, so it will be challenging for the investors. They will be more skeptical in investing in these bonds. There's one important concept that you need to understand here. See, if the country go for issuance of greater number of GDP linked bonds, it is inherent that the country is expecting lower GDP growth. And suppose the sovereign borrower is issuing more GDP linked bonds, that means that the investor will become skeptical. So the investment in other bonds will decrease. So the interest rate on conventional bonds have to be increased in order to keep them still attractive. Pure GDP linked bonds have been issued earlier by countries like Costa Rica, Bulgaria, Bosnia in 1990s. And bonds similar to GDP linked bonds have been issued earlier by Argentina and Greece. But India has never issued it. And the article says that India should also issue GDP linked bonds with a maturity period of 25 years. The article suggests that there should be a call option. That means the government can exercise the option of repaying the debt instead of keep paying the interest after five years if the government feels that it has sufficient finance with it. Now let's discuss the second and widely talked about option to finance the government initiatives. That is to monetize non-core assets of PSUs. Non-core assets are those which are not critical to the operation of PSUs. Generally, the assets of PSUs are categorized broadly into three types, lands and buildings, operational assets, for example, pipelines, mobile towers, which are critical for their operation, and financial assets such as equity and debt. It has been observed and also recommended by many committees like Rangarajan Committee, Kalka Committee, that non-core assets of PSUs should be monetized. Many of the lands and buildings are not efficiently used by these PSUs and they are not core assets. So this could be one source of revenue generation for the government. The article in fact identifies 15 PSUs that have substantial amount of non-core assets and they owe government more than rupees 25,000 crore. So not only non-core assets can be monetized, these money that these PSUs owes to the government that can also be recovered. In this regard, you must know that the article offers a very good solution, very innovative solution to the problem of monetization. Because government and the PSUs may find it difficult to monetize the non-core assets, the article is asking to set up a holding company that it has named as Holdco. And the PSUs must transfer non-core assets to the holding company Holdco and the holding company will look after the business of selling those assets. So that will be very efficiently managed and the price that can be earned out of those assets can also be higher. The third option that the article offers to get the money from is to tap into the excess liquidity of PSUs. PSUs out of their profit earns money and they deposit it in the bank. The article identifies that 15 PSUs have around 65,000 crore, which is much higher than their operational requirements. So the PSUs can be allowed to retain the cash with the banks as much as they need for their operation for the next say six months or so. And the excess cash and bank deposit should be transferred to the government in the form of dividend. So this is also one way in which government can finance its relief package. However, you can think of some other innovative solutions to finance the relief package of 1.7 lakh crore. Do some brainstorming and give in the comment section some suggestion of yours to finance the relief package of the government. You can start thinking from what government has already done, for instance, slashing down the salaries of MPs by 30%. You can also suggest some extreme measures like bringing in financial emergency. You can also think of some innovative solutions like masala bond, NRI bonds. But do think of something and suggest in the comment section. This is a lead article taken from page number six. It is titled, Needed Greater Decentralization of Power. The theme of the article is Indian Federalism. Indian Federalism is a very important topic mentioned in the syllabus. It's mentioned in GS Paper 2 syllabus, issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure. UPSC has asked questions umpteen number of times on Indian federalism. UPSC has asked static questions to compare and contrast Indian federalism with others. UPSC has also asked this topic integrated with the current affair. For instance, they asked this question on how the Indian federal structure will be affected because of the GST. 
And similarly, this article has discussed Indian federalism in the backdrop of disaster of COVID-19. The author appreciates how swiftly and with efficiency some of the states have worked to deal with the disaster of COVID-19. For instance, the state governments triggered Epidemic Disease Act 1897, even before the central government evoked Disaster Management Act 2005. And some of the states like Kerala, Telangana, even Punjab, UT of Delhi have worked exceptionally well in containing the disaster. And this shows that these state governments are not only acting as laboratories of democracy. This was a phrase given by former US Supreme Court Judge Justice Lewis. But they are also acting as a reasonable power center. However, the state governments are under restrictions. Some of the restrictions are natural because they are one unit within the union. And some of the restrictions are imposed by the federal structure of the Indian constitution. Article identifies three specific limitations on the working of the state government to deal with the present disaster. One of that is the inability of the state to access funds and thereby structure their own welfare packages. As we have discussed before, the limitations to access funds come from the fact that after the GST regime, the state government cannot change the indirect taxes and raise their revenue as per their own wishes and their own demands. Because that is said by the GST council and that has restricted the ability of the state government to raise their own revenue. Secondly, there are constitutional limits put by the article 293.3 that the state government, if they have to raise revenue from outside to breach this 3% target of fiscal deficit put by FRBM Act, then permission from the central government has to be taken. And this essentially restricts the ability of the state government to raise their own revenue. There is a third source of revenue generation that is in the form of transfer from the central government, but transfer from the central government have been increasing since last few years. So there is no complaint to be made here and there is no elbow room to raise revenue here. The second restriction that the article identifies is more of an administrative restriction. And that restriction is imposed by the working of public finance management system. Public finance management system basically is a platform to well manage the finances of the central government. And this exists before the differentiation between planned and non-planned schemes were dissolved. And at that time, it used to manage the finances of the central government of the planned schemes. But now that since differentiation is gone, presently the ambit of public finance management system is to cover the central sector schemes, centrally sponsored schemes, as well as expenditures including the finance commission grants. But because of the bureaucratic hurdle, the delay, the state government is not able to get the money from the central government on time and that restricts their ability to manage welfare schemes. A third restriction identified by the article is the colossal disruption of supply chains. The state government are not able to manage their supplies because of the integrated supply chain of the country and that has been disrupted at many ends. But that is beyond the ability of the state government to manage because state government are units in the union. So they cannot manage the entire supply chain that is within the country. So that's a natural restriction put on the state government. However, because of the elaborate machinery of the state government, because they are more near to the beneficiary, the article is batting for more decentralization in the administration and more power should be given to the state government and down up till the Gram Panchayat to manage quarantine facilities, social distancing, social contact tracing and the union must command less and coordinate more. That is the spirit of cooperative federalism. The article also recalls, which will be a refresher for the exam, Federal Features of Indian Constitution There are five important federal features of Indian Constitution that the article has discussed. One of that is 7th Schedule. See, the 7th Schedule to the Constitution divides responsibilities between the two layers of the government, the Union Government and the State Government. The Union Government is tasked with matters of national importance such as foreign affairs, defense, airways, etc. But the responsibilities vested with the states are no less important and rather they are plenary in nature, they are autonomous in their own domain and very important subjects like health, public order, sanitation, agriculture, police among others are in the state list in the schedule 7. That is why this is a very important federal feature of Indian constitution. Indian parliament is a bicameral parliament having two houses, Lok Sabha comprising directly elected representatives 
and Raj Sabha, comprising members elected by the legislatures of the state. And Raj Sabha is a very important federal feature of Indian constitution. Financial autonomy of the states is another very important federal feature of Indian constitution. Although it's true that much of the taxation power is with the central government, but the constitution makers did divide the taxation power between the central and the state. The center has the power to tax all incomes, other than agriculture incomes, and to levy indirect taxes in the form of customs and excise, but the sole power to tax sale of goods and entry of goods into the state west with the state government. And this shows that the constitution maker had all intention to give some sort of financial autonomy to the state government. And this is very important for the state government to run their own welfare schemes and to deal with the disastrous situation like presently we are in. Supremacy of the constitution. See, the basic structure of the constitution is indestructible as laid out by the judiciary. And constitution is the supreme law in India. This is very important because bicameral parliament and many other federal features of Indian constitution is part of the basic structure of the constitution. And since basic structure of the constitution cannot be changed, the federal features have to be remain intact. So, supremacy of the constitution itself becomes a federal feature of the Indian constitution. And so does independence of judiciary. Unitary form of judiciary that we have, that is a unitary feature of Indian constitution. But independence of judiciary is considered the federal feature of judiciary because this task of maintaining and preserving the basic features of Indian constitution and to see if any steps of the executive or legislation of the parliament is not in contravention to the basic structure of the constitution, that task is with the judiciary. And independence of judiciary is crucial for that. So independence of judiciary is also a federal feature of Indian constitution. However, despite of these provisions, Union government repeatedly had shown the propensity to treat states to use the language of the Supreme Court in S.R. Bumai case, appendages of the center, something that has been attached merely for no function rather than some rudimentary functions. That is the way the Union government has tried time and again to treat the state government. And the article cites few instances. This is important for answer writing in the mains exam. You must know the current issues in Indian federalism. One of the issues touched by the article is 14th Finance Commission's recommendations. The central government willingly accepted and implemented the recommendation of the 14th Finance Commission to increase the share of the states in devolvable tax volume from 32% to 42%. However, the gains by the state government due to this recommendation has been completely offset by the simultaneous decline in the grants by the central government. Central government runs centrally sponsored schemes and in those centrally sponsored schemes, central government gave grants and, and in other ways as well to the state government. But by increasing the money supply from one pocket, central government reduced the money supply from another pocket. So there was no overall gain to the state government due to this implementation of 14 Finance Commission's recommendation. So the article is trying to say this is how the union treat the states as appendages and any step to share and devolve power with the state is only ostensible. It is only a gimmick. The article says that goods and service tax regime has striked the constitutional federal edifice. It has made the very survival of the state dependent on the grace of the union. As we have discussed before, this has seriously restricted the ability of the state government to raise their own revenue for their own welfare schemes. And there are other issues, for example, goods and service tax compensation to the state of the tune of 40,000 crore is pending. And recently, many state government has written to the finance secretary to disburse this amount. The propensity of the central government to bring bills in the parliament in the form of money bills goes seriously against the federal spirit of Indian constitution. For example, recently Aadhaar bill was brought in the form of money bill, although later it was upheld by the Supreme Court of India. Because as per the Supreme Court, a lot of finances of the central government is involved and many schemes will be implemented through the Aadhaar project. So the central government is well within its right to do it, but the propriety of it is still cautioned. Governors are considered as the long arm of the central government in the state. Rather than acting as the head of the executive in the state, governors mostly act as agents of the center. Then the article brings up Article 370. 
the way in which the state of jammu and kashmir was snapped into union territory in a jiffy and it was torn apart into two union territories no opinion was taken by the state legislature this again is a grim reminder of the fact that the union always treat the states as their own appendages these are very important issues of indian federalism from the current affair and this you must keep in mind for answer writing for the mains exam and because of this propensity of the central government to treat the states as its own appendage we are reducing the promise of article 1 of the constitution of an india that is a union of states to an illusionary dream although the article is not prescriptive in nature it has not given as to what could be done to make indian federalism more cooperative in nature but it urges and it shows that the present performance of the state government exceedingly well is calling for greater decentralization in indian federalism this article from page number 8 titled importance of soft power is increasing globally is important for gs paper 2 for international relations this is basically an interview of the president of iccr indian council of cultural relations indian council of cultural relation is going to have its 70th anniversary on 9th of april because it was established on 9th of april 1950 it is an autonomous organization of the government of india and it is involved in india's external cultural relations through cultural exchange with other countries and their people it was established by the first education minister of india maulana abdul kalam azad in our discussion here we will deal with soft power very comprehensively as much as is required for the examination the political scientist of harvard who coined this term as per him soft power is the ability of a country to persuade others to do what it wants without resorting to force or coercion according to him soft power lies in a country's attractiveness and comes from three resources culture political values and foreign policies this is a standard definition of soft power that you can take up for the examination soft power although slower to yield result it has permanent effect and also it is less expensive than military power as exercised by us or economic inducement as exercised by china the importance of soft power is due to its ability to influence others unintrusively or unconsciously see india didn't like it when imf imposed conditions on her in 1991 but india has willingly set target for ease of doing business index of world bank and that is the difference the difference between coercion and persuasion imf what it did was coercion and world bank through its ease of doing business index is doing persuasion that is what soft power does soft power bring changes which is permanent in nature willingly and most of the time unconsciously india has huge resource of soft power with it India's spirituality is much needed to the world in the present time of conflict and strife. India has given to the world the philosophy of Vasudev Kutumbakam. The world is one family. Loka samastha sukhino bhavantu. Meaning let there be peace in the whole world. And India's idea of tolerance for all religion and culture is legendary. India has long civilizational links right from rome to central asia to southeast asia sri lanka africa to all the countries in the region india has always been the torch bearer of non violence when jews were prosecuted throughout europe india offered them safe refuge and that is one important reason why the relationship between india and israel has gone up to the strategic level Declaration of 21st June as Yoga Day by United Nation is one of brightest example of India's victory of soft power. Indian cuisine with use of spices and herb are becoming popular in countries especially with large population of Indian diaspora for example United Kingdom. In UK there are many outlets of Indian foods becoming very popular these days. You know at one point of time the television show kyunki saas bhi kabhi bahuti was extremely extremely popular in afghanistan indian diaspora is one of the biggest resource of india's soft power abroad the indo us nuclear deal was facilitated because of the effort of indian diaspora even the recent howdi modi event was also facilitated by indian diaspora india's respect and prestige at global level is because of the democratic institution that india has been successfully running after independence 
India is world's largest democracy. India never had a military dictatorship. India has had free and fair elections since independence. India's democracy has allowed traditionally marginalized sections like scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, even women to participate in governance. India has free media, robust civil society, independent judiciary. So and so, Bhutan and Nepal, their recent shift towards democracy has been inspired by India's long history of thriving democracy. Use of soft power and persuasion in international relation can be seen from the policy of Panshil and non-aligned movement. Realizing the power of soft power, India has very actively started to use soft power in international diplomacy from last one and a half decade. For instance, India started Public Diplomacy Division in the Ministry of External Affairs in 2006. India also expanded the scope and functioning of Indian Council for Cultural Relations around the same time. Ministry of Tourism and Ministry of Overseas Indians were successfully roped in. Ministry of Tourism has been successfully running Incredible India campaign. And Ministry of Overseas Indians has made a lot of effort to showcase social, political and cultural assets abroad. India further galvanized Look East policy, which now is Act East policy and connect Central Asia policy. India has successfully developed strategic aid and trade partnership in Africa. India has opened in collaboration Sanskrit institutions in many countries. India has also successfully revived the famous ancient institution Nalanda University in partnership with China, Japan, South Korea and Singapore. Around 2005, India also started to actively participate in the democratic process in the world. India was the second largest donor to UN Democracy Fund and India started to help countries through electoral assistance to strengthen the rule of law. Afghanistan in fact is the test of effectiveness of the soft power. India has deliberately refused to send any military missions in Afghanistan and instead has pursued soft power strategy to gain Afghan goodwill. And this has been so, so rewarding that Afghanistan is one of the strongest ally of India in the Central Asia and it has become a strategic ally of India in fighting terrorism emanating from Pakistan. And from the mid of the last decade and even more so from 2014, India has started to include diaspora in foreign policy strategy. These are some of the efforts India has put in to utilize the soft power for diplomacy at international level. The question is how successful India has been in utilizing soft power for international diplomacy. First, let's look at Africa. Africa is the theater of competition between India and China. And India cannot afford the deep pocket diplomacy that China runs there. India is no match for China's massive financial investment in Africa and moreover in different places in Asia. But however, we are still competing in the niche areas of India. India has been focusing on soft power, most importantly in developing human capabilities in Africa. We are giving trainings to soldiers, to engineers, we are also giving training to develop self-sufficient villages in many countries in Africa. And this seems to be the only practical way to counter the new colonial model that China is running in Africa. Afghanistan, as we have talked about, has become one of the India's strongest ally in the region. Similarly, Bangladesh was one of the pearl in the string of pearl of China that we have managed to pull out. Although Bangladesh officially is part of a string of pearl, but Bangladesh remains the strongest ally of India in the region. Bangladesh has cooperated a lot with India on sensitive issue of internal security. If you want to look at the fruits that soft power has borne for India, India keeps getting elected many a times unopposed at global institutions like United Nations Human Rights Council and many others. India has been exempted for NPT. The nuclear deal of 2008 between India and US was mostly because of the soft power through the Indian diaspora in US. Now I'll leave you at this. You have to do a little bit of brainstorming and in the comment section tell me more fruits that has borne out of soft power for India. This article from page number 7 titled It's Time for Red Berets is Futuristic in its Outlook. And this could be studied under important international institutions of GS Paper 2. In the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic, WHO as an organization has been severely criticized. It has been blamed for mismanagement or less efficient management of the pandemic. Even the developed countries like US and UK are struggling to arrest the effect of the pandemic.
In this background, the author suggests to develop a new institution that will be capable enough to handle a pandemic of global scale. So just like Blue Berets, as United Nations Peacekeeping Force is known as, the author is proposing to develop Red Berets, which will actively carry out measures across the world to arrest the effect of global pandemic. And this will be effective for COVID-19 and if any such, God forbid, pandemic appears in future. The author in the article discusses Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, where the power has been bestowed on United Nations Security Council to have military and non-military measures to restore peace and security in the world. And the author explores that the power bestowed on United Nations Security Council via Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter is sufficient to develop a body which the author is proposing to be named as Red Berets. And then he go on and on giving more arguments for such a body. Now since this is just a novel idea and it may or may not fructify in the near future, it's not very important for the exam. But as a suggestion to write somewhere as a way ahead, you can use this point that such a global body should exist. If you are interested more in this, you can read the notes that we have provided in the PDF which is given in the link of the video. But as such, since it is still evolving idea, we will not be discussing because it's not very important from the exam perspective. From our discussion so far, I'm boiling down the points which will be important for answer writing. They will be kind of value addition for the answers that you will be writing for the mains exam. They could be anything. They could be Supreme Court judgment. They could be a flowchart. They could be some important economic data. They could be some important observations made by the Supreme Court. They could be some phrases for the conclusion. They could be anything that will add value to the answers that you could write in the mains exam. We saw a phrase called as laboratories of democracy. States in a federal setup are referred to as laboratories of democracy and this phrase has been popularized by United States Supreme Court Judge Justice Lewis to describe how some states, if citizens choose, can serve as laboratories. They can try novel social economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. And in India, many states have embarked on doing experiments. For example, in terms of e-governance, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh has done. Public procurement from the farmers has been done by Madhya Pradesh in innovative ways. Similarly, scheme Kalia of Odisha. Every state has certain things and central government many a times pick up these from the states and incorporate in the central schemes. And you can use it specifically in context of COVID-19 that many states are doing experiments and hence you can use this phrase somewhere, laboratories of democracies. When you talk about federalism, when you talk about competitive federalism and decentralization, you can say that union government must command less and coordinate more in the conclusion of your answer. You can use the observation of Supreme Court made in the SR Burmai case that union has repeatedly displayed a desire to treat states as appendages to the center. And to conclude your point that union has the desire, the propensity to use the states as appendages to the center, you can say we are reducing the promise of Article 1 of the Constitution of an India that is a union of states to an illusionary dream. You might also like to remember some data of economics for the mains examination. You should know that the fiscal deficit of center and state combined is 7.5% and the combined debt of center and the state stands at 69% of GDP. By the time you will be writing mains this year, this number will more or less be same. So you can remember this data. Even if you don't update, you can use this data in the mains exam. In the mains examination, writing international case study is important. And you should remember that certain countries has issued GDP linked bonds. For example, Costa Rica, Bulgaria, Bosnia, they have already issued pure GDP linked bonds. And countries like Argentina, Greece back in 2005 and Greece in 2012 has issued instruments which are somewhat similar to GDP linked bonds. India so far has not issued GDP linked bonds, but you can give it as a suggestion in the coming times that India can issue, but with high maturity period. Soft power is an important topic for the mains examination and you should have a standard definition because this can come anytime. Soft power is generally defined as the ability of a country to persuade others to do what it wants without resorting to force or coercion. Soft power basically lies in country's attractiveness and this stems out from three factors culture, political values and foreign policies. And then you can update your notes on soft power and you should touch upon various factors from where the India's soft power stems from. For example, spirituality, non-violence, long civilizational link, Indian cuisine, Indian diaspora, the biggest source of soft power in the present time, 
yoga, pan shield, India's foreign policies that includes pan shield, that includes act east policy, connect central Asia policy, etc. The democratic institution that India has been successfully running is one of the important source of soft power. Similarly, India's movies and television soaps are also very popular abroad. Now the summary for the prelims examination. In the beginning of our discussion, we saw public fund management system. You must know that it has been developed and implemented by the office of CAG under Ministry of Finance. It's an old platform previously used to look after the plan schemes expenditure of the government of India. Now it manages the government expenditure under central sector schemes, centrally sponsored schemes and also other expenditures including finance commission grants. The main purpose is to have an effective fund flow system from the central government to various stakeholders. And this also has been integrated with the core banking system of the country. We saw the federal features of Indian constitutions and that includes seventh schedule, bicameral parliament, financial autonomy, supremacy of the constitution and if somebody asks you independent judiciary is part of federal feature of Indian constitution, the answer would be yes sir. We have also touched upon State Disaster Response Fund yet again. Although this has been covered previously elaborately, but you must know that this fund has been established under Disaster Management Act 2005. It was done on the recommendation of 13 Finance Commission and it is part of public accounts. This is given as grant in aid to the state and 75% of the fund comes from central government for general category states and 90% for special category states. There is an executive committee headed by chief secretary who looks after the expenditure from the fund. And of course, it will come under the ambit of home ministry. We have discussed GDP linked bonds today and you must understand GDP linked bonds are those in which the rate of interest payable for the bond is linked to the GDP growth rate of the country. So if the GDP growth rate is less, the interest payment will be less. So it is very safe for the sovereign borrower. And that is the most important advantage of GDP linked bond. It is safe. The possibility of default is less. There is higher sustainability of the debt and the contagion effect is less. If the sovereign government starts to default, the whole economy will go topsy-turvy. And that does not happen with this bond because the chances of default is very less. Also, the volatility of this bond is less as compared to equity and debt. But there are disadvantages. The most important disadvantage among all is if the sovereign borrower starts to issue GDP linked bond, that means there is chances of lower growth in the economy. And in that case, the investors will panic, they might run away and the investment in conventional bonds will be less. To make the conventional bonds favorable, their interest rate has to be hiked up. We saw a term asset monetization today. In order for the central government to finance its relief package of 1.7 lakh crore, there is a requirement of asset monetization of PSUs. Asset monetization essentially refers to selling of non-core and sub-optimally utilized assets of the central public enterprises. We have discussed an important body today that is Indian Council for Cultural Relation. You must know that it is an autonomous organization of the government of India involved in India's external cultural relation with other countries and citizens of those countries. It was established way back in 1950 by the first education minister of India, Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad. With this, we have essentially come to the end of the discussion for today, but we will not be taking up practice questions, which you have to practice from the e-learning platform. But we will take question for the day. The answer to the question of the day for yesterday is B. The first statement is wrong here. Gaganyaan mission, the spacecraft will not be going to the altitude of 700 to 800 km, rather 300 to 400 km. That makes the first statement wrong and the second statement, Vayo Mitra is a humanoid, that will be the part of the mission is correct. Let's see the question of the day for today. The question is, which of the following comes under the ambit of public fund management system? Central sector schemes, centrally sponsored schemes, finance commission grants. Your options are 1 only, 1 and 2 only, 1 and 3 only, yeah, fair, all of the above.